Warning, if you're European, please turn away from this episode. The level of ignorance on display regarding European politics and elections may induce severe and uncontrollable rage. So parliamentary elections were held in the EU a couple of weeks ago, and it did not go well. Check that. It actually went pretty well for the right-wing movement in Europe. Most Americans caught wind of some kind of election in the EU, but I think it's fair to say that few of us really understand what it's all about. And with good reason. This stuff is really confusing. Scores of parties under the umbrella of seven coalition parties, 720 members representing 27 nations, two councils, a commission, a bank, and a court. No one's in charge, and everyone's in charge. So in this episode, we're going to break down the governing structure of the EU and lay out what was at stake in this election. UNFTR. Before we start, let me just say that UNFTR is made possible by the love and support of our members. For information on becoming a member, please visit UNFTR.com. There, you can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter and access our archive of podcast episodes and essays. While you're there, feel free to browse our directory of progressive resources. Together, we're building the largest online progressive community, and we'd love nothing more than to welcome you to the fold. And now, on with the show. The people of Europe decided to slide to the right after elections were held for the European Parliament. We'll do our best to break it all down because it gets a bit confusing. So before we dig in, what questions can I answer for you? Um, well, who was elected? What were they running for? The elections were for the MEPs, or members of the European Parliament, which is kind of like the House of Representatives of the EU. Okay, um, is there a Senate? Kind of. They have the Council of the EU, which of course is different than the European Council. The EC? Yes but not the same EC as the European Commission. So there are two ECs. Yep, see if you can follow along. The EU is made up of the European Council, or EC, and the European Commission, the other EC. The Parliament is made up of 720 MEPs that are elected as members of individual parties from member states or coalition parties that are also on the ballot in these nations. Then, ministers from each state are chosen to be on the Council of the EU, while commissioners from each of the 27 member states are appointed to the European Commission, which is kind of like the executive branch of the EU. The judicial branch is represented by the EU Court of Justice, and there's a central bank overseeing each of the member nation's central banks called the ECB or the European Central Bank. I have so many questions! The parliament is made up of MEPs representing several parties. Most are a coalition of scores of national parties from each member state, and then there's one central party called the European People's Party, or EPP, that citizens of member countries can also vote for. Sometimes the individual parties fall out of favor with the umbrella party, which is what happened in this election when the far-right German party, the AFD, was kicked out of the ID, or the Identity and Democracy Party, because it was seen as too extreme. And there are individual candidates that can also run unaffiliated and throw their support by whomever they choose when Parliament is formed. Still confused? Don't worry. We're about to break it all down and translate it into American. Let's zoom out and put the EU in context. The EU formed in 1957 with six founding members, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Over time, it added members to where it stands today at 27. The EU is basically the European continent's answer to the United States. Now, being a member state means that you agree to certain economic, agricultural, immigration, and environmental laws and policies. Most, but not all of these countries, also use or at least accept the euro as their currency. While not a military alliance or a single body like the United States— the idea was to establish a broader quasi-federal economic and legal framework so Europe could compete with larger economies like China and the U.S. and trade on a more equal footing. It's a complex yet in some ways fragile alliance that not everyone in Europe loves, as evidenced by the Brexit vote a few years back. Overall, though, Europeans are largely in favor of being part of the EU. That said, the minority factions that are vehemently opposed to it are loud and getting louder. And that's somewhat what this election demonstrated. Every five years, citizens of the member nations in Europe head to the polls to elect the MEPs, and more than 400 million Europeans are eligible to participate. 
As we said before, the parliament is kind of like the House of Representatives in that there are a bunch of open seats, 720 to be exact, representing an array of political parties from all over Europe. Broadly, the major parties in the European Parliament from left to right are as follows. You've got the left party, which is obviously on the left, the Green European Free Alliance, resident environmentalists of the EU, socialists and Democrats, which are actually considered center-left, Renew Europe, a centrist party most associated with Emmanuel Macron, the center-right European People's Party, where the current leader Ursula von der Leyen hails from, the European Conservatives and Reformists, most closely affiliated with right-wing Georgia Maloney of Italy, and the far-right Identity and Democracy Party tied to the villainous Marine Le Pen, Macron's nemesis in France. Here's the first wrinkle that makes it a bit different. You can have a left-wing party in France and one in Germany that appear similar when you line them up head-to-head, -head, but they can fall under different umbrella parties. So the first step is to affiliate the national parties with the umbrella party that most closely resembles the desires and interests of each nation. See, liberalism and conservatism might have very different meanings in France and Hungary. That's how we get seven major parties, but the individual parties can be severed from the umbrella, and that's what happened with the far-right party in Germany, for example. It's one of the quirks that makes it difficult to tally the final vote until the dust settles completely. Anyway, the MEPs that are eventually seated wind up in Parliament, which creates legislation that is passed to the Council of the EU. That's the body that acts more like the Senate if we want to draw any sort of comparison. This council is comprised of ministers from each member state. Now, in Parliament, the leader is typically drawn from the party that has the majority. In this case, it's still the EPP, which is a centrist party that is leaning increasingly toward the right. And we'll talk about the differences among and between these right-wing factions because that's a really important part of the puzzle. Let's continue breaking down the structure before we get there, though. Each of these bodies has a leader. There's someone in charge of the European Council, the European Commission, the Council of the EU, the Court of Justice, Central Bank, and Parliament. It's why we can't really think of a central figure like a president or a prime minister when it comes to the whole of Europe. But of all of these organizational heads, it's the head of parliament that is most often recognized as the top of the hierarchy. Now, this figure is responsible for the politics of the EU, setting the agenda, building coalitions, establishing legislative priorities, and coordinating with other heads of state. And currently, that person is Ursula von der Leyen, the center-right politician from Germany. And as head of the EPP, the largest representative bloc in parliament, von der Leyen is the odds-on favorite to continue in the role, but that's where the story gets interesting. We can talk about the importance of these elections in two ways, perception and reality. Most people on the left are freaking out right now about the perception of these elections. So think of these parliamentary elections as you might the U.S. midterm elections. Sure, there can be a shift in the balance of power, but it's mostly seen as the electorate sending a message to the executive branch. In this sense, this election was a fairly bold rebuke of liberal and leftist policies across the board. From the far left to the center, it was a bloodbath. Again, these aren't final numbers, but when I was putting together the script for this recording, the left party had already lost two seats and had the smallest to begin with. The Socialist and Democrat Party lost four seats. The Green European Free Alliance lost 18. And the Macron Center Party Renew Europe lost 19, the biggest absolute loss in the election. The biggest winners were the far-right ID party under Le Pen with a nine-seat pickup. The Maloney-led ECR with three additional seats, and von der Leyen's EPP was the big winner with 13. Heading into the election, there was a sense that the right had the hot hand, and this is where the jockeying and the posturing went into high gear. So let's talk about the right in Europe and name some names. In the Netherlands, the far-right party leader and rampant Islamophobe is named Hurt Wilders. He didn't have as strong a showing as he had hoped, but he has still moved from the fringes and onto the main stage in Europe. And he shares this stage with figures like AFD co-chair Alice Weidel in Germany, Marine Le Pen in France, Viktor Orban in Hungary, and Giorgia Meloni in Italy. Save for Orban, these political figures were outliers and just kind of troublemakers for the most part until recently. Now they've become important power brokers in Wanderland's bid to hold the top spot. 
With far right and conservative parties picking up so many votes in this election, the EPP has no other choice but to form alliances to its right to hold on to power. But not everything is hunky-dory on the right. There are serious differences between the parties that prevent them from forming a more durable alliance. Perhaps the biggest chasm of all is the war in Ukraine. The far right in Europe is aligned with Vladimir Putin and vehemently opposes supporting Ukraine. The conservatives are more supportive of Ukraine but are calling for a diplomatic end to the conflict with the EU playing a major role in negotiations. And the center-right has been firmly aligned with Ukraine, which is the biggest stumbling block the EPP has at the moment in wooing more support from the far right. So in terms of perception, the right-wing parties of Europe are gaining legitimacy in a way that they haven't experienced in several decades. And of course, when it comes to the European continent, a hard right turn has a history of working out pretty poorly. Here's pompous right-wing blowhard Douglas Murray attempting to alleviate fears surrounding this conservative turn. The continent is turning right, and not in the way that the BBC, for instance, would like to portray it as, you know, the right is marching, on the march. They always say the right is on the march. The left is never on the march, it seems. They just slope or something. Mm. Um, but but they, they, they want to run their, you know, the right is on the march pieces. This isn't that. This isn't fascism or anything like that. But it is a definite move. So I suppose it's a fair point to suggest that electoral rebukes of liberal policies are hardly indicative of a slide into fascism. Then again, Viktor Orban is one of the longest tenured leaders in Europe, and parties like the AFD in Germany and Le Pen's Ressemblant National or National Rally have some pretty fascistic ideas. And that's where this move goes from perception to reality. So let's talk about sugar beets. Yes, sugar beets. It's one of the most prominent crops in France and super important to the global supply of sugar. One of the reasons sugar prices have been so high is because of environmental regulations on the use of certain pesticides that prevent insects from destroying sugar beet crops. These regulations intended to preserve honeybees caused French farmers to turn away from producing sugar beets even though prices are going through the roof. And scenes like this are playing out all across Europe. Because one of the areas the rubber meets the road in the EU is environmental standards and regulations. And big ag in Europe is fed up. Agriculture remains vital to the identities and economies of several European nations, and the increasing oversight from the Big Brother EU Parliament is wearing thin. Anti-immigration sentiment has also increased dramatically over the last decade or so, which was one of the primary drivers of Brexit and a flashpoint in the Netherlands and France, among other countries. Mixing this sentiment together with high borrowing costs combined with sustained austerity measures from central economic authorities continues to aggravate several national leaders, and the combined inflation and interest rate pressures have filtered all the way down to the household level as well. Hmm. This all sounds vaguely familiar. Populations that feel economically squeezed while their bourgeois liberal governments do little to halt rising inequality, blaming elites and globalists for financial insecurity while immigrants fleeing political and climate crises stream across the borders? Yep, that's the part. So the reality of the parliamentary elections might be much more than people sending a proxy message to their individual leaders. There will likely be real change in European policies toward economic measures, environmental standards, and immigration laws. And if we play that out a step further, one can easily see how this accelerates each one of these factors in a negative way. Loosening environmental standards will slow the progress made in the EU toward hitting IPCC targets. This in turn will hasten the degradation of the climate, which will spur more climate refugees. The loss of productive agricultural land to the ravages of climate change will contribute to food shortages, which will have an inflationary impact on food prices, and the cycle of madness continues. Perhaps the biggest reaction to the far right turn in Europe was in France. According to the New York Times, quote, in France, the voting ushered in a political earthquake. Soon after the results were announced, President Emmanuel Macron announced on national television that he would dissolve the country's National Assembly and call for new legislative elections, end quote. Snap elections like these can be unsettling, but they happen more often in parliamentary democracies than you might imagine. Now, some people think that Macron is playing with fire and that he overreacted. 
But his supporters are a little more optimistic, believing that Macron's centrist party will remain in favor, thereby quelling the momentum of Le Pen's perceived surge and taking the wind out of the sails of the national rally. Basically, that's what he's trying to show, that the EU elections are just warning shots, but that the people feel differently. And then there are those who see this as an incredibly cynical play to say, go ahead, you run the country. So the idea here is that Macron is actually protected in his role as president. It's the French National Assembly members that have to fight for their political lives. If he loses, meaning they leave, and the country grinds to a legislative halt, it would further frustrate the masses and demonstrate the right's inability to lead. In theory, Macron wins either way. Either he's vindicated by the electorate or vindicated by the right's ineptitude. In theory. If anyone embodies everything wrong with the liberal establishment in Europe and around the globe for that matter, it's Macron. The French leader has found himself increasingly isolated from both the left and the right. Marine Le Pen, while falling short enough of gaining momentum to topple Macron, has proven to be a stubborn opponent. Moreover, she succeeded not only in uniting the right in France, but increasing her visibility on the European stage. The left in France was finally able to coalesce around Macron's anti-labor policies in the last elections, but that alliance appears to be waning. As the Jacobin writes, quote, The alliance of all left-wing formations from Parti Socialiste via the Communists, the Greens, and France and Soumise seems to be disappearing. These parties are all running separate lists for the EU elections. Worse, this division is taking place at a time when in France, as around Europe, we're seeing rampant inflation, growing social grievances, and, above all, a massive far-right breakthrough. The question of how to form a common front faced with these pressing demands is thus a recurrent concern on the French left, end quote. Macron has managed to piss off almost everyone in an attempt to straddle the middle and assert himself as the ultimate statesman able to meet the moment on a continent in turmoil. He's become increasingly militaristic and anti-working class in an attempt to pass himself off as a strong man. This is, as usual, a classic blunder on the part of the liberal bourgeoisie, always desperate to maintain power by projecting strength. According to the Times, quote, right-wing parties now govern alone or as part of coalitions in seven of the European Union's 27 countries. They've gained across the continent as voters have grown more concentrated on nationalism and identity, often tied to migration and some of the same culture war politics pertaining to gender and LGBTQ issues that have gained traction in the United States, end quote. I think we can all agree that a far-right nationalist surge in Europe has a pretty terrible track record. This moment is reminiscent of another time the European nations were tested by a war on the continent that drove nationalist tendencies. After the shock of the Russian Revolution, there was a sense that Germany might be next in line for a socialist movement to take root. Instead, the German SPD leaned into bourgeois nationalism and turned its back on populist worker movements by issuing war credits. Left movements were brutally put down, leading to the executions of key figures like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, effectively neutralizing the left wing in Germany and paving the way for Anton Drexler's German Workers' Party, which eventually morphed into the German Nazi Party. And it all happened very very quickly. It happened over about three years. So when figures like Douglas Murray assume patronizing postures and dismiss the correlation between far-right rhetoric and fascistic tendencies, they're either historically illiterate or deliberately obfuscating. Snuffing out left-wing movements and promoting half-measures that ignore the authentic expressions of disenfranchised workers is a dangerous game. We're seeing it in the United States. Take Biden's border policy. His half-hearted root cause strategy in Latin America ignored the larger context of economic and physical insecurity that looms over many of the originating migrant nations. It was wholly insufficient to bring about real change and failed to halt the flow of asylum seekers at the borders. And so he moved right in an effort to steal Trump's thunder on the border ahead of the election. At the very moment the United States needs a coordinated left-wing movement to address the concerns of the working class, the so-called left is in shambles. Cornell West and Jill Stein are rounding errors in the grand scheme of things, and even they're at odds. The Bernie wing has splintered over the massacre in Gaza, 
and a failure to mount a united progressive front to pull the Democratic Party to the left as well. The only three candidates in contention for the presidency are center-right, far-right, and who the hell knows? The same holds true in Europe where the far left finds itself in utter disarray and on the outside looking in as the EPP coordinates with the likes of Maloney and Le Pen to retain power. Capitalism will always produce half measures that betray the working class and build wealth and power among elites. It will always protect those in power and pit the bureaucrats against those they're hired to serve. We know from our progressive meditation episode that we lost the 2024 election in America a long time ago and now Europe is heading in the same direction. Left-wing victories in Latin America are the outliers in the world today, but at least they provide a glimmer of hope that leftist values can take hold. The only question is whether these lights will burn bright enough to guide progressives before capitalism's final act brings about the next great war and we descend further into the climate abyss. Here endeth the lesson.